Welcome to the live stream. Today, we're going to be answering questions regarding usajobs.gov, the federal government hiring process. In any type of government job question you may have, just put it in the chat and I'll get straight to that. But first, before we do that, let's look at some of the previously submitted questions and answer those. The first question comes from Brian Wan, 5732, who asks, who should you put as a reference in USA Jobs Resume Builder? I don't want my coworkers to know I'm applying to another job. So what HR or hiring managers could be looking at are people that can attest to your work behavior, your work ethic. How did you perform as a worker in your previous companies? What I would do if you do not want people to know at your current position that you're applying for a job is look at a past job. Or if you do not have your, a past job, let's say this is your first job, I would look at some of the people that you interacted with at university or some other professional type setting, even volunteer work, include those people down. And this is a reminder that when you're listing your references, particularly your supervisor, you can put in brackets, contact me first. That lets HR know not to contact that reference being that it might be your, your current supervisor. You don't want to let your current supervisor know. So they will reach out to you through email or phone and ask you, is it okay if I contact this person or who else should I contact? So um, I would keep that in mind. Another thing is do not put someone down there that you know is going to speak negatively of you, of your work, your, your work activity, your work behavior. So if you know someone doesn't like you, don't put that individual on your resume because there's a chance that they can't contact that person. All right, next question comes from Lauren Tam 52 who asks, my husband retired after just shy of 24 years of service is building his resume now. How many years should he go back to his government resume? Okay, as a general rule, I would say do not go back further than 10 years. You can if there is specific experience you want to highlight that's directly relevant to the job that you're applying to. If there is not, then I wouldn't go back more than 10 years for relevancy's sake, because the skills, the abilities that you showcase, your experience, all of that stuff is more relevant within the last decade than if you look two decades or even more, and you could be dating yourself. Another thing to add on to that is I would strive and make an effort to keep your resume to five pages because what we're seeing more and more are federal agencies that are limiting the resume review to five pages. Now you can submit a seven or eight or 10 page resume, but they might only instruct the HR specialist to review the first five pages. And this makes a lot of sense because we have people submitting 20 page resumes, 25 page resumes, or even greater than that. And it takes time. It is lengthening. It is making the whole entire hiring process take that much longer because we have people looking at every page. So I think it's a great thing. And I would say right now, probably I would, I don't know, 35, 40% of agencies are doing this. You can catch it in the job announcement. It's going to, it's going to specifically state we're only reviewing the first five pages. So keep that in mind also. Next question is from Kiwick Draw McGraw, who asks, I am a VA nurse, really wanting a remote job, but every time I see a position, hundreds of people apply and I never get a call back. How do I stand out? I'm a veteran if that helps. All right, so let's just, let's look on USA Jobs. You are a nurse. I don't know what job position, what job you're actually applying for. As a reminder, if you're looking for remote work positions on usajobs.gov on this page, this is once you click search, you'll see these two tabs, top filters and more filters. You go to more filters, you scroll down and you click only show remote work jobs. Right now there's 344. Usually there's between 300 and 600. Just a couple of days ago, there was 400. Uh, I imagine as we get as we enter into the summer months, this number will probably increase. And the reason for that is the budget. There should be some sort of resolution with the budget. So that could see this spike up five, six hundred. Once you click that, show only remote. It's only going to show us the 344. You scroll down to series. Now, nurse is in the 0600 series, so we can look and see how many nurse positions. There's one. There's one nurse position. 
So if you're applying for that, there's probably hundreds or thousands of people applying for that 0610. What you can do if you're looking for remote work is go outside of the 0600 field. Go outside. There's 0601, there's 17 jobs. But what I would do, look first at 0300 because you're going to have what do we have here? We have close to 70, no, over 70, over 75 jobs in the 0300 for 100% remote work. As a nurse, you have administrative experience, you can lean into that. And if you have any IT experience, you can also consider 2210. They usually have quite a few. Let's see how many they have. There's 28 and there's one for a student. That's IT. Those are usually the two biggest job series for 100% remote work. But I tell you what, it's going to come down to your resume. Do not let the job announcement dissuade you so much because, yeah, you can have a thousand people apply. There could be multiple positions that the job announcement is hiring for. But outside of that, you need to have a competitive resume. You need to be hyper focused on the achievements and are they result oriented? Are they quantified achievements? Do they truly showcase the depth of your experience? Because if they do not, if you're just showing that you're minimally qualified, and that's what a lot of people do, they put their responsibilities. I was responsible for this role. I did the, the exact same role in my previous agency or company, but it's not enough to show that you're minimally qualified. You have to go above that and actually show the true depth of your experience. And you can do that by adding numbers, by thinking about what you actually did in your previous job. And one way to do this is look at your previous evaluations. Look at the times. If you're in the military, look at your OERs and your NCOERs. If you're a government employee, look at your annual performance reviews. If you are a private sector company, there are times where you get reviews as well, quarterly or annually. Look through there and there, there will be nuggets of achievements that you were able to, to either accomplish or you contributed to success within that organization. You need to pull that out and you have to craft it. That is how you're going to stand out among all these other people. Another way to stand out is the virtual hiring events. If you have a non-competitive hiring authority for you, let's say that you're a disabled veteran, let's say you're Schedule A, if you have something like that, I would highly encourage going to virtual federal hiring events. And if you're not already signed up to the newsletter, sign up to the free newsletter down below. There's a link. You can sign up completely free. Every week, I push out a list of these virtual hiring events that you can attend. You can stay at home and do it from the comfort of your couch. I've known many people and I've actually been in a situation where I've met coordinators, veteran coordinators that help place veterans, Schedule A coordinators that help place Schedule A. So this could be a huge benefit. All right, let's take a look at the chat. See if we got anybody in there. Shimp Howard, good morning. Thank you for joining me this morning. God's favor, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. MC, good morning. Thank you for joining me. L. Matt, good morning. Teresa, good morning. Christopher, good morning. Great to see everybody in here. All right, let's switch it back. Let's go back to the previously submitted questions. And the next question. Jay, let's see what Jay has to say. Jay asks, can you roll over previous IRA 401k funds from previous jobs into thrift savings plan? Is it a better idea to open up another private IRA? So yes, you can. The best way to do this is probably by mail. Because if you're trying to do this on the website, on the TSP website, you're probably not going to get anywhere. Same thing if you call them. You're probably not going to get anywhere. The reason to roll over your 401k into a TSP is to keep things simple, right? So the TSP, they have certain funds. You have your C fund, your S fund. One of them invests in the S&P 500. And then you have your I fund. That's the international fund. Then you have um, G fund, which is more government securities. So it keeps things relatively simple. With a 401k or an IRA, you have more uh, customization. So if you want to invest in certain companies, let's say you want to invest in high growth companies like Netflix, Facebook, you know, companies like that, that you think are going to have outsized returns, you can do that in a 401k. You can do that in a lot of IRAs. Some people would say, take your 401k and roll it into an IRA so you can maintain that customization. But if you want to have everything in one location and you do not mind the more streamlined approach, the more simplistic the, the 
the more simple approach that the government takes when it comes to investing in the market, then do it with your TSP. So that's going to be a personal decision for you. Good question, though. Our next question is from Tito Diaz, 4807, who asks, what are your thoughts on a private sector worker pursuing joining Department of Homeland Security uh, CBPO as a GS7 for the first time as a federal employee? So I would say, if you have limited experience, let's say you're coming out of university, you've only worked a couple of years, I think this is a great move. I think it's a good idea. Go ahead and accept that position and continue to move up the promotion ladder. Keep applying for next uh, your next opportunities. However, you know this is going to depend on the location. If you're in a high cost area, maybe it's not so. Maybe it's not a good move. And also, if you have over I don't know five, ten years of experience and you're applying for a GS7, I would say it's the complete wrong move. Now, a lot of people that I talk to they sell themselves short. They have 20 years of experience or more, and they end up applying and accepting to like a GS5, a GS6, or even a GS7. You have to understand that GS6 and 7, and even 9, are considered entry-level positions. I say GS9 because you do not need experience for some of the GS9s. You need a graduate-level degree to qualify on education only. That is an entry-level position. You can find it on the recent student pathway. GS6 and GS7 is more bachelor's degree, four-year degree. The, this is for people that have absolutely no experience. They have the education, and they're trying to get a role in, in the government. If you have the experience, the experience is the main thing. When I hear people talking about, I'm considering going back to school, or what certification should I apply for, or I want to get another master's degree. When I hear all of this, I'm, I'm thinking, great for personal development, if that's a goal that you have, you know, pursue it. I wish you the best. However, if you think that's somehow going to open up a door where you're going to be found more qualified, nine times out of 10, it's not. If it is not a requirement, if it doesn't say that this is an educational requirement on that job announcement, no one's really considering it. Maybe the hiring manager might consider it, um, but probably not. Probably not. Most hire managers I talk to, when they see extra master's degree, it doesn't do anything. They want to know, have you been performing those tasks at another company or agency? And if you have the correct experience, and then after that, they want to know, are you a good fit? Are you a person I want to have on my team or not? So that's what they're looking at. So I would focus more. One, get the experience if you don't have it. And volunteer experience is fine. And then two, work on how you're portraying yourself. Work on how you're interviewing. So, you know, those are the two main things, not pursuing uh, multiple master's degrees. And this is usually from the military community. If you talk to like a senior non-commissioned officer or especially um, a field grade military officer, they collect degrees because the military encourages it so much. They will have like a master's in leadership, a master's in military strategies. And what are we going to do with those graduate level degrees? It's bettering you as a person. And I get that. But as far as career success, it doesn't always translate. Okay, enough about that. Next question. We got one from Peter. Peter in Handley. Who asks, I'm in a GS position with promotion potential to a higher grade after 12 months of my current role and grade. What should I expect as far as a promotion? Assuming that I perform my job satisfactorily, does it vary agency by agency? Well, Peter. If you're in a government, then getting a promotion, it comes down to waiting the 12 months and then talking to your supervisor. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be the first time I talked to your supervisor. As soon as you get into the position in every quarter at a minimum, I would talk about your performance. Is it acceptable? What you consider satisfactory could be wildly different than what the supervisor thinks. A, a lot of this also has to do with how your personalities are meshing, unfortunately. But I would come back. And I would ask on a quarterly basis at a minimum, hey, I was able to do X, Y, and Z. Do you think I'm on track? Am I on track? I'm really trying to achieve the promotion at the end of the year. Do you see any gaps? Is there any area I need to work on? So talk about that. That way, when the 12 months comes here, when the 12 months finally arrives, you'll get the promotion. And 
How that works is you're going to be at work on your work computer and you will receive an email. And that email will be from HR or will be from some sort of human resources automated system. It'll tell you that your SF50 was updated and there'll be a link. You'll click the link, you'll access the, the web page, and then you'll look at your new SF50 and it will show a promotion. And that's how you know that it went through. And the most important thing like I said, is to keep an open channel of communication between you and your supervisor. Okay, let's check out the chat. Do we have anybody in the chat? Anybody that I missed? Okay, question. Incognito 11, good morning. How long does it usually take for an interview to be set up after you receive the referred status and assuming you're chosen to interview? Well, the timeline is going to vary drastically, but I would say on average, once you receive refer, it really should happen within one to three weeks. It could be longer. There's three points of failure when it comes to the hiring process. You have human resources, then you have the hiring manager, and then you have the security team. Now, the security team is not going to matter, matter because what you're after is the interview. You Human resources is huge. They could be understaffed. They could be overwhelmed. The hiring manager is huge because that's the individual that's actually selecting who they want to interview. There are times where they don't select anyone for an interview, or there are times that they cancel the job announcement. So that could also be, you know, that could be a possibility. The way that I look at it a lot of the times for many people is when you receive a referral, there's about a 20% chance, give or take, right? Plus or minus, 20% chance that that will convert into an invitation to interview. And if it doesn't, that means that the hiring manager looked at your application, looked at your resume and said, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to interview this guy or this lady. I want to interview these people instead. They'll pick five, six, seven people and say, let's interview these people. Now, what sticks out on your resume that has the potential to captivate the attention of the hiring manager, or you know, it could they could their eyes could glaze over when they're looking at your stuff and they're like, you know what, that, that doesn't interest me. That's not really a good fit. That's not what we're looking for for a member of the team. So keep that in mind. Next question, Spin 7 p.m. If you are already a GS7, but have tons of experience, can you apply for GS11? Yes, you can. You can do this if you apply to open to the public positions. When it comes to open to the public, the time and grade rules will not apply. So you can apply to a GS-15, hypothetically, if you have the required experience. And the same is with some of the non-competitive hiring authorities. You can also apply and time and grade doesn't come into effect. So if you have, this happens in the military when people come in and they accept a GS-6 or a GS-7, but they have 20 plus years and they could easily qualify for a GS-11 or GS-12 or higher. They come in as a GS-6, then they apply for a GS-12, let's say six months later, and they're able they're able to get it. So, you know, it happens every day. I would encourage you to do that if, if, that, um, if that falls under your situation. All right, let's see. Next question. What do we got? We got this right here. Brian Baker, good morning. It seems like college is becoming more irrelevant nowadays. Do you think that the favorite government will make less of a requirement for hiring. Brian, absolutely. And I feel like this is a message I've been trying to send out for many months, if not over a year. It has become a lot less important. 80% of jobs on usajobs.gov, they're not going to have an, a college requirement. The jobs that will have a college requirement are the professions where you can't escape it. When you're talking about attorneys, you know, lawyers, obviously, when you're talking about doctors, medical professionals, nurses, things like that, accountants, there'll be a CPA requirement. Excuse me. So <clears throat> you will have those professions. Engineering is another one. But outside of those, when you're looking at IT professionals, you're looking at administrative, you're looking at jobs like that, financial specialists, they're not going to have a degree requirement. And in many cases, having an additional degree will not give you any points. They will not prefer you because of your degree. It will come down to the experience. And if you do, like I say, you're an engineer. You're an engineer. You have an engineering degree. 
Well, all the other engineers have the exact same degree. So you don't keep pursuing a graduate level or higher in engineering. What occurs now is you need to work on your experience. You need to work on how you're showcasing it or get more experience. That's going to make you uh, best qualified from qualified to well qualified to best qualified. That's what puts you in the bucket of best qualified, the experience. All right. Next question, Ricardo. Good morning, Ricardo. If you are not referred to the hiring manager or you or you are further along, but you are not selected, is it worth reaching out to the HR at the agency to get any feedback on my application? Unfortunately, Ricardo, it's not worth it. You can try it. I'm not saying don't try it, but this is what happens is you'll have a position that dozens, if not hundreds of people apply for and HR or the hiring manager, they're not going to spend the time because everyone who's not selected, let's say that, you know, if 300 people apply, then you'll have over 200 people that are wondering why they didn't get selected. For one reason, they're not going to do it because it's extremely time consuming. But I think the real reason they're not going to do it is they don't want to open themselves up for uh, a lawsuit. They don't want to be found like they discriminated because they gave you the wrong answer. And most hiring managers will not tell you and HR specialists will not tell you. Now, if you're in a situation where you feel like you should have been referred, you can reach back out to HR and say, hey, I have the necessary experience. Look on page three, second paragraph. I have the relevant experience. Why was I not referred? And sometimes they'll say, hey, you're right. You know, you're right. And uh, if it's before they made a selection, they could even end up referring you. So you can do that. But when it comes for reasons of non-select, they're not going to give you much feedback, if at all. Good question, though. Next question. Jose, for a position that I know I'm qualified for, will the hiring manager review the entire resume since my current job does not have a lot of relevant experience, but my last two positions do? Yes, I would say they will review your entire resume. Um, so in this type of situation, maybe your first page doesn't have relevant experience, but maybe your second page has the relevant experience. If that's the case, I really am not a proponent of putting experience that is not relevant. In some way, some fashion, the experience should be relevant, even if what you're doing right now is not directly, right? So most, let's say most job announcements, they talk about you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to collaborate. In whatever position that you're in, you can focus on that. You can focus on communication. Every job requires communication. And, you know, if you're applying for project management, I would find a way, regardless of what job that you had, whatever your current or past job is, I would try to find a way to make that experience relevant to some of the keywords that they're looking for in that job announcement. And that might mean that you don't have very much for the first position. Maybe you have three bullets. Maybe the second position, you have two bullets. But the one that's directly relevant, you have a lot. You're expanding on that. You're speaking more on that. You have more achievements listed under that position. So, um, yeah, they're supposed to review. They're supposed to review the entire thing to answer your question. Next question, DD. Good morning, DD. Should I copy and paste recommendations from my former direct reports onto my resume? I would not. I would not put recommendations on your resume. I would put your direct, relevant experience. So whatever you did. You had direct reports. Whatever your organization was able to achieve or your team or your office, I would focus on that. And this comes down to what job you're applying to because all the answers are in the specialized experience section and also the duties. If you've already exhausted everything in specialized experience, scroll up on the job announcement, look at the duties and find ways to articulate your experience based on those keywords. It's not going to come down to, there's so much unnecessary information I think that people put in their resume. They put uh, summary, professional summary, professional objectives, goals, skills at the top. Don't put that stuff on the top. You're, you're leading with your relevant experience. That's what's at the top. And the rest of it can be at the bottom. The, the mission, the um, recommendations, all that other stuff, I don't think it's necessary. If you want to include it, put it at the bottom because you're leading with the strong stuff. That's what I would say. All right, next, what do we got next here? We have It's Saint. Good morning. 
Just wanted to say thank you for the videos. Well, you're welcome for the videos. They're going to keep on coming. I'm a month to my new position with a three-letter agency. It was a long process, but I got my step increase negotiated. So thank you. Hey, congratulations on the new job. I wish you the best in that. Thank you for joining me and uh, expressing the gratitude. I really appreciate it. Uh, here we go. Tyler Simmons. If I got a county government pension and took a federal job, could I roll my pension into FERS? I would say probably not. If it's a pension, if it's an investment vehicle like a 401k or, or an IRA or something like that, then you could roll it in. If it's a separate pension, I don't think they're going to communicate with one another. Uh, next question. We got Ricardo again. After several applications of not going anywhere, does the agency HR put you in a blacklist and don't even look at your later applications, no matter the changes I make to the resume? No, no federal agency is supposed to maintain any type of blacklist. I know a lot of people are concerned or worried about it, but that's not the case. Even if you keep applying to the same position and they so that you apply one time and they reject you and then you see it pop up again and you keep applying, keep applying. I would keep making the modifications to your resume to make it match a little bit closer or to expand on the depth of your experience that you have related to that job announcement. I would do that, but don't give up. Keep applying to that. Don't worry about that. HR people are switching out all the time. Hiring managers are switching out all the time. No one has that type of institutional memory to, to think, oh, we're not going to accept, you know, from this guy. In fact, you know, to speak more on that point, we have, this is true, we have uh, federal government employees that get on like a PIP, a performance improvement plan. Like they, they have negative, they have poor performance. Let's just say that. They have poor performance in one office of an agency. I'm not going to mention the agency, but one office that person, even though everyone looks at that person, they're like, hey, this is not a good teammate. This is not a good worker. That a person applies to another office within the same agency and they end up getting the job. And then you have lots of stories of people getting fired and then applying to another agency and they get the job. So there's not a blacklist being ma maintained. All right. Let's go. Uh, incognito. I have five referred ranging from two to four weeks since I've received the emails. Keep applying, Incognito11. Keep applying. We have Evan Wonderland. Is it worth it to move across the country for a higher GS if they do not offer relocation? Evans, that comes down to your situation and your bank account. You have to look at your bank account and say, am I willing to do this? In some situations, it is. People do this all the time as well. They'll move to an area to get a higher GS grade or for a position that has a ladder. So let's say you're a GS7 and then you apply to open to the public and you're able to get a GS11 in Philadelphia, but you're over there in Arkansas right now. Well, Philadelphia has a GS11 that goes up to GS13. Can you make that move? How much is it going to cost you if there's no relocation? It's going to cost you some, you know, at least a couple of grand, a few grand. You might have to stay in an Airbnb. You might have to get a studio apartment. Do you have a family? If you don't have a family, then you're able to move. A lot of people I talk to have a family and they're anchored in that location. And sometimes that location is Iowa or Missouri and they're just anchored there. And it's hard. The kids are in school. They don't want to relocate. You know, it's a whole thing. But if you're a single individual and you have the option to move and let's say you have a few thousand, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, you know, you would, that's something worth considering. But I would not move with a tentative job offer, I would probably move with a final job offer. And uh, that's something that you're going to have to consider is based on your situation. Next question, John O'Keefe. Do you have any general tips, advice for a new federal employee who is just starting their federal career in their early 20s? Some things you knew, you wish you knew when you were just starting out. So, John, this is going to come down to what agency and what position you're in because they can vary drastically. You can have a high tempo, super stressed out position in the office of chief financial officer, or you could be like in a sub agency cor correspondent office where you're not doing much but twiddling your thumbs, any and everything in between. But I would say when you're first starting out, you have to understand you're going to feel you're going to feel overwhelmed no matter what. Even if you're not doing much, you're going to feel overwhelmed because you're going to have a lot of acronyms thrown in your face. You're going to, all the people in your organization, excuse me. 
<clears throat> the hierarchy, all the individuals, the executives, you're going to have to learn all these people's name, personality, you know, your personality and your team's personality. How are they going to mesh? But I would tell you this. Most people are disappointed when they come into the government and there is not a fully fleshed out training program. And many people have this idea that this institution has been around for so long. It doesn't matter which one, you know, Department of Justice, uh, Department of Agriculture, whatever. It doesn't matter the agency. They have been around for multiple decades, if not over 100 years. And you expect that they would have their training program completely dialed in. I know people from the military, they're used to having a training program 100% complete, ready to go. You just put the person in there and they get trained up. That is often not the case. You end up learning a lot of stuff on the job and from just random people. Like you might have Brad come, Eric come one day, Susan's coming the next day, and you're slowly learning. You know, you're slowly learning what your roles and responsibility is going to be. You're slowly learning how to do the function that you were hired to do. And it could feel very overwhelming. And at times you can feel like you're not meeting the standard and how will you ever do it? And you get kind of stressed out, but a lot of that's in your head. You will grow into that position. Look for opportunities to volunteer around the office so you can help people out. You can build goodwill. Look for how systems interact with one another because the more of the pieces of the puzzle that you slowly start to understand, the more everything is going to make sense. And then you're going to reach a point where you feel like you learned everything. You're not being challenged anymore. And that's a good indicator on when to start applying for the promotion or for the next job. So that's what I would tell you. Okay. Um, next question, Art Lee. I'm a month into my federal government job. Congrats on the new job, Art. What is your advice for TSP options? So I have to preface this with this is not financial advice because you're not supposed to give financial advice. But I would say what I'm doing, I'm just going to tell you what I'm doing. What I am doing is I'm in CNS. I'm in the C fund and I'm in the S fund because to me, that's where the growth is at. I'm not looking at retiring tomorrow. I'm not looking at retiring in the next year or two, right? I still have some time on the horizon, hopefully. So I'm heavy on C. I'm heavy on S. I stay away from I. I don't know what's going on with international markets. I don't really want to know, to be honest with you. And G, government securities, that's where you go. To me, and this is just to me, you go to the G fund when you're a little scared. When you're scared of economic uncertainty, because the G is not going to it's not gonna fluctuate wildly. You're not going to see huge decreases in the G fund. So that's where people go usually, like a couple of years before retirement, they hide out in the G fund because they don't want, they don't want their money to take a huge dip down. But if, if you're younger, I would say if you're under 50 years old or under 45 years old and you have a little appetite for risk, you got to stay in the CNS. That's where you're going to see the growth. That's what I would say. That's what I do. I'm not telling you what to do. That's what I do. All right, let's see. All right, no question, question. We got another question here. We got Sam Sims 100. Can I negotiate a step increase after accepting a tentative job offer for a lateral position at a different agency? For example, if I'm a GS-14 step three and my offer is for the same, can I negotiate to GS-14 step five? If you are a federal government employee, you are not able to negotiate your step level, period. And that's just it. That's it. The only way that your pay, your pay will fluctuate, if you're a, GS, you're a GS-14, if you take a 15, you're going to get a pay increase. The two-step rule will come into effect. So if you're a GS-14 step, or excuse me, if you're a GS-14 step three, you would look out and see how much would I make as a GS-14 step five, and then find that salary on the GS-15 side. And that's how much you would start out at. If you were to take a lower position, say you were taking a GS-13 because you wanted to change locations. I don't know where you're at right now. Say you're going to, let's say Missouri, you're going, you want to take a GS-13. A lot of agencies will try to do some pay setting so you don't lose out on a lot of money. But um, as far as the steps, that, that's not going to happen as a government employee. A common question that maybe some people have is if I'm changing locality areas, let's say you're in New York City as a GS-14, step three, and then you go to, let's say, Kansas. Even though you're a GS-14 in Kansas, it's not going to be paying the same as New York. So you're going to be taking a pay decrease. 
and they're not going to be able to match your pay. And they're not going to even try because it's a locality difference. The way HR thinks of locality difference is, well, it's cheaper here, so you should be able to make it. And it's not, it's not a problem for them. So that's another thing to consider. Another question, Brian, Brian Wan, can I switch or make edits to my resume after I submit my application, but it's before the announcement closes? Can HR still receive my application before the announcement closes? Yeah, you can, but I tell you what, oftentimes when you do that, it looks like you're submitting two resumes because you submit the first resume, and then you're coming back and you're editing it, and then you're submitting it again. But what should happen is the most, um, they'll have a date on there when, when you modified it. So they should be able to see the most updated resume. But your old resume will probably still be in there as well. But yeah, make edits all the way up until the close. That's fine. All right, let me get back to the previously submitted questions. Let me take that down. Hey, everyone, thanks for being here with me this morning. I really appreciate it. Could you also click the like button? Because... I would love that. That would really help me out if you could click like. It would it would help out the algorithm, get more people in here, and that would be great. Thanks. Um, but, um, before we get to the next one, have you guys heard about the Bureau of Prisons? There's a lot of jobs there. <laughs> a lot of people don't like them. They're undesirable. Nobody wants to work for the Bureau of Prisons. And it's understandable because they have a low ranking. But if you're hurting and looking for any way to get into the government, I tell you what, the Bureau of Prisons will probably be open arms. They'll probably welcome you in with open arms. They have about 400 jobs open right now, a lot of them for correctional officers, but not all of them. They have some administrative positions in there as well. And they just went through an OIG audit. I have a video coming out tomorrow about this. Um, basically, things are bad there, and they're looking for people. They're aggressively looking for people. $10,000 bonus, $15,000, $20,000 sign-on bonus. So... If you're willing, if, I would say if you're younger and you have that high risk appetite, look at that. That's an option. Okay. Next question. KP99. Where are you at, KP? KP99. What type of government job would be good for somebody with a personal financial advisor or stockbroker background? Well, if you have a finance background, let's go back to USA Jobs. You're going to look for 0500. Uh, anything finance is 0500. So let's look over there. Let's get rid of remote. We got remote on here. Remote's not a good fit for everybody. Remote's really competitive, but if you want it, you know, keep doing it. Let's exclude remote. All right, we still got 10,000 jobs. Great. So, so finance, for you finance people, people with a finance background, look at 0500. And we'll look at it real quick. So what I would tell you, I would say start here, 0501. You got over 200 jobs right now. 0501 is probably your best bet. If you have limited experience, start off at 0503. These do not usually require a degree. You do not have to have a degree in finance. You need the experience. And if you have less experience, 0503, like I said. Now, when it comes to accounting, they're going to want a CPA a lot of the times. They're going to want a bachelor's in accounting. When it comes to auditing, same thing. They're going to want some education. Here's a good one, 05, 0560. This might not apply to this person's uh, situation, but this right here, 0560, a lot of people. If you have a little finance experience when you're looking at budgets and numbers and spreadsheets, a lot of people could fall into this. So I would look at that. Um, but for your situation with financial management, you can look at 0505 as well. But I would start off at 0501. That's what I would do. Okay. Let's get rid of that. All right, next question. Next previously submitted question. We have my OB2K who asks, what happens when you get another job during your developmental position? All right, so if you get another job, great, take the job. If you're in a developmental position, let's say you're from a, you're in a job that goes from GS9 to GS, or excuse me, GS6 to GS9, something like that. That's pretty common. If you're there, let's say you're a, you're there a year, you went from GS6 to GS7, but now there's a GS11 offer. And the way you were able to get that is because you apply to open to the public positions and you have a GS11 offer. You, you're going to take that. Time and grade is not going to imp impact that. You're always going to be looking for better opportunities. Some people, they have a hard time leaving an agency because they develop some sort of professional relationship with your supervisor or your coworkers, and you feel like, oh my goodness, I don't want to abandon ship. We have an audit coming next quarter. 
They need me here. They gave me the chance. The whole reason I'm in the government is because of this person. And you start to form some sort of loyalty towards them. And there's nothing wrong with loyalty. But when it comes to what is your, in your best interest career-wise, what's going to put more money in your pocket and develop you towards your goals and objectives in that career. Maybe your goal is to be an executive or to be a GS-15. I don't know what your goal is. But keep taking those opportunities, regardless of what job you're in, if you're in a developmental position or not, is what I would tell you. Next question. Uh, what do we got? I'm a 60. This is from D Kirk 5845. I'm a 62-year-old. I was a vocational rehab counselor for a state agency for 15 years. I had to stop. No job in 15 years. How do I address that big gap? I would like to work for about 10 more years. 15 years is a large gap. D. Kirk, 15 years is a large gap. So what I've spoken to people in the past about gaps, usually um, I have concerns. People have concerns with five, 10, 10 year gaps. 15 is very big. What I would do is look at two things. First, have you had a business? How were you able to get revenue these past 15 years? Look at what you have done. Even if it's a side job, if it is your own entrepreneurial pursuit, your your small business, and I would highlight that as experience because it is experience. Next, I would look at volunteer. Main thing in volunteer, you're looking at your school, you're looking at your churches, you're looking at your local city government, see where you have volunteer, emphasize that experience. What we cannot have you do is go in there on the job search and say, hey, for 15 years, I was hands off completely. I did no developmental positions. I did not exercise experience in any way. If you do that, they're going to look at your past experience from 15 years ago, and they're going to say, how relevant is that really? When was the last time he touched a computer in a professional capacity? You have to show that you've been doing it you know, in order to get the best results, I would tell you. So look for areas where you do have experience. It's just not traditional job experience. That's what I would say. Okay, let's jump into the comments. The comments, the chats. Okay, what do we have? I'm missing some. Okay, let's go with Brian. I'm currently a GS14 step five, applying for GS13 positions at the IRS. If I get the job, will they likely match my pay? In other words, offer GS13 step 10. You are a 14 step five? Yeah. <clears throat> I think there's a there's a very strong probability that they would. More often than not, when agencies see that you're taking a step down, they try to set your pay. That's done. It's not guaranteed. I would have that conversation with them. And you can have it all, you know, once that tentative job offer hits, when you're showing your SF50, you're sending it to the HR specialist, bring that up as soon as possible. Like, hey, I, I would love to take advantage of this opportunity and I'm excited about joining the IRS. But uh, currently, this is my salary as a GS-14. Would I? Would you be willing, would your agency or your office be willing to set me in a step 10? So I'm only losing a few thousand dollars a year as opposed to twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, right? So I had that conversation. April, why does direct hiring authority take so long for selection after they call your references? The dynamic between the hiring process is going to be drastically different depending on the office. If it's taking forever, there could be a chance that even though it's direct hire, they are not in need as much. Maybe they already hired a couple of people last month and they feel like they stopped the gap and now they're taking their time. Or it could be something outside of their control. It might not be agency specific. It might be more in the HR office. Oftentimes the HR office is not in the same physical location of the headquarters of the agency or where you're going to be physically working. They're not in the same location. They're in a different state completely. You know, the uh, veteran affairs, for instance, their headquarters is in Washington, D.C., right by the White House. I worked there for a while. And their HR office is in Texas. So you're talking about, you know, multiple states away. All right, let's see. Next question. Shanta, Jesse, good morning. I'm trying to get back into logistics, but my experience from the last 10 years is healthcare and IT. Can I put my military experience at the top of my resume if it's from when I was in the, the military? 
you can put your experience anywhere you want within your resume, but most people would recommend to you the way that USA Jobs resume builder is structured is to go in chronological order with the most recent time. Now, what you're showing HR is that your last 10 years is not relevant. But if you look past a decade, I have relevant experience. And I don't know if that's going to get you the best results that way. You can do it and see what happens. You know, try it like that. Maybe do this. Maybe try it the way that you're suggesting, putting your military experience at the top. My worry is because it's over 10 years ago, it's not going to have the same impact. It's not going to show that it's relevant enough. And then another way I would try it, you know, do it your way and then also have another resume formatted differently and put your healthcare and IT experience up there. But try to make it relevant. I know that you did not perform in a logistical capacity in the last 10 years, but there are things that you could have done. You're in healthcare and you're in healthcare. Did you ever have to order healthcare equipment? Probably not, right? Did you ever assist? Maybe you assisted somebody in ordering healthcare uh, equipment. I don't know how it works in healthcare, right? Healthcare, I'm just going to say equipment. So maybe you identified that the inventory was low in certain areas. So you communicated to the person that actually does the ordering or you facilitated or helped the process out. I would try to find a way how you're connected to the logistical chain, even though your experience is largely healthcare and IT. And I think, I think with some effort over the last 10 years, you can find small pockets of experience and you can list it. It doesn't have to be super long. Just list the top two, three things that are somewhat related to logistics. And then, you know, also focus in on your military experience as well. It's really interesting. Uh, it, it's going to depend on, it, it comes down, to, once again, it comes down to your actual experience. Okay. Brian Wan Will you be on probation again if you're in the competitive service and transferring an agency for a different job? There's a probability. There, It's a chance. I tell you what, if you're moving into a supervisor position for the first time, you're going to go on probation. And oftentimes it'll be two years. If you're moving to, let's say you're moving from the, um, the Department of Energy and you're going to the Department of Defense, there's a chance that you'll be on probation again. The DOD loves to put people on probation. Um, so yeah, th there's a good chance that you will be on probation again, but don't let that worry you. It's like over 90% of people are able to get through probation with no issue. All right. <clears throat> Next question, Christopher, Chris Gomez. Good morning to you. When submitting my DD-214 as a required document, is it okay to submit a redacted SSN, a social security number, or must it be non-redacted? You can redact it. There's no problem with that. Most people do not redact it, but you can, if you're worried about your personal information getting out there, you can do that. There's no issue with that. Uh, also, hey guys, no social security numbers on resume. I saw a social security number on a resume the other day and I couldn't believe it. If you do that, that could disqualify you. You're not supposed to put that on your resume. You're not supposed to put your picture on your resume. And I would go as far as you probably don't want to put a LinkedIn link on there because when you go to LinkedIn and you click that link, the first thing that pops up is a picture of your face. And you're not supposed to have pictures of your face on your resume. So don't do that. Um, okay, next question. Nathan, I'm a social worker in Texas, experienced working with veterans in medical setting, interested in working for the VA, but find it difficult to get referred. Your schedule A. Your resume includes the key skills and ability, the knowledge, skills, and ability, and duties. All right. I hear I hear the, the, the struggle. I hear the pain. With Schedule A, I'm going to ask you, are you connected with a Schedule A coordinator? There's Schedule A coordinators out there. You email them your resume, your Schedule A letter, and they, they're supposed to help you. That's one thing. What type of job... Where in Texas are you? Are you around the Houston area, the Dallas area, the Austin area? It's going to depend on what type of jobs are you are you targeting. You're interested in working for the VA. The VA has hundreds of jobs. Are you interested in working in a medical in a medical capacity? Do you, are you a nurse? Are you a healthcare provider? Or are you interested in working in an administrative capacity? A lot of jobs in the VA are medical, but they're also administrative. You can find administrative jobs that you can probably qualify that you're probably eligible for on your experience. I don't know your direct experience that's on your resume. Your resume 
is probably the issue. When it comes to getting referred, your resume does that. When it comes to getting the interview, your resume does that. When it comes to getting your job offer, well, your personality, <laughs> your personality and the way that you're interviewing, the way that you're communicating, that's what's going to get you the job. So things to consider. Um, next question, April, can you negotiate your work schedule if you receive a tentative job offer at VA in DC? I'm assuming you're saying at the Veteran Affairs and not at Virginia, in DC. Can you negotiate your work schedule? No, that's not typically done. There's three things that are negotiated. If you're new to the government, then your step level, your leave, your leave accrual rate. Everybody who comes into the government, they start off with four hours per pay period of leave. Now you can negotiate that. And if you're a military veteran, that changes everything up as well. And then your start date, you can negotiate your start date. So if they want you to start next week, you can say, hey, what about three weeks from now? What about four weeks from now? People negotiated up to six weeks and agencies have accepted it. So you can negotiate that. Your work schedule, you can ask that question at the end of the interview. Like, does your agency support a compressed work schedule? And that could mean a compressed work schedule in DC in some situations, you have people that only work four days out of the week because they work 10 hours, 10, 10, they call it four tens. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they're doing 10 hours. And that means every single Friday they have off. That means every single week they have a three-day weekend. That happens in a lot of agencies. But usually those conversations are held after you get the job offer and you're, you're speaking directly with the hiring manager. And a lot of agencies, especially in the D.C. area, they support that. The ones that don't, I would say there are some one there. There are some in DOD that are a bit more strict. And the same thing with Department of Homeland Security. There are some that are are a bit more strict with that. So you're going to have to ask. All right, let's go to the previously submitted questions. Good question, April. Thank you for asking that. Let's see what we have. We have Brian Wan says if there is a RIF, a RIF is a reduction of force. Would they select based on overall federal years of service or years with that specific agency? I have 15 years as a federal employee and I want to move to the IRS, but I'm afraid I might get laid off due to the change in IRS. Okay, so the, the law for RIF, there's four main retention factors. You have the tenure of employ employment, which is like your type of appointment, right? You have veterans preference, you have total credible years, and then there's also performance rating. The agency develops a retention register. Excuse me. All right. So it's the ranking of employees in the competitive level after the agency applies those four retention factors. So short to make it short is it depends on the agency and what they're doing. But I wouldn't worry. I mean, I really wouldn't worry about that. You know, uh, rifts are not as common as, let's say, the private sector where it's super common. So if you see a better opportunity in the IRS, go ahead and jump after that opportunity. All right. John O'Keefe asked a question. He says, I'll be starting a federal government job in April as an NO-22104. So this is an NO-4. This is a ladder position up to NO-5. Do you know where I can find the pay scale? I've been struggling to find it. So NO-4 and NO-5, that's like a GS-11, GS-13. If you just look at the salary level, it's kind of equivalent to that. This position, this pay band is usually used in the Department of Navy. I'm not sure exactly where to find it. I would start with the Department of Navy. Look in there, see if you can find it. Um, really, there's over a dozen pay bands all throughout the government. And what I usually do is look at them to see how they match up with the GS grade. And sometimes it doesn't match up exactly. Or there's like if you look at NH, NH has a large range uh, compared to the GS pay band. So um, there are other ones that go past GS 15. So in that way, you wouldn't be able to measure it up or you would say it's GS 15 equivalent. But you have positions in the FAA, the FDIC, the SEC where it goes over 200,000 a year. And right now a GS-15 can only earn up to 191,000. So there's like a, there's a disparity. There's a gap there. All right, let's see. We got any questions in the chat. Um, what do we got? We got K. Good morning, K. Hypothetically, is it harder to get rid of a transfer employee on probation who is competitive permanent than a new employee on probation. It would be easier to get rid of the new employee on probation because they are at will 
and you're competitive, if you already have status, if you have competitive status, I would say that offers you another layer of security. Then if you're completely new to the government and you do not have status, status being three years of competitive service. And um, yeah, so that's what I would say. All right. All right, back to the previously submitted questions. Thank you for asking that, Kay. J, J96163 asks, can you, can you explain the difference between credit hours, comp time, overtime, and when is it appropriate time to request? Okay, like I said earlier, when you first start working a government job, you, occur, you are accruing four hours of leave per pay period unless you negotiate it. If you're giving comp time, it's probably because you worked when you were not supposed to be working. So let's say it's Saturday and they want you to jump on a meeting for two hours and your supervisor says, hey, I'm going to give you comp time. Well, that's between you and your supervisor. Oftentimes it will not even reach your time card. Now, over time, that would need to be approved. And if you're GS10 or below, that's usually time and a half. So whatever your your uh, hourly rate is, just times it. One and a half your pay. If you're above a GS10 step one, then you would just earn your regular hourly rate. So if you're earning $53 an hour, that's what you would be earning for overtime. There are some agencies that really encourage people to take overtime. And as much overtime as you want to take, they're going to grant it. And that's a way for you to get you know more money. But it's going to be taxed. You know, everything is taxed, my gosh. Um, with the time, with the time card, usually you have to input your time card unless you have a time, a time keeper. So some offices have a time keeper and they do everything. Otherwise you're going to be responsible for your own time card. And usually for the pay period, it has to equal 80 hours. Otherwise it sends up a red flag. So despite there being a federal holiday or you didn't work one day or took sick, you know, you took some sick hours or you took a sick day, all of those hours are going to have to end up to 80 unless you have approved for overtime. Next question is Carl, Carl 7647, who says, I am a 50 something considering applying for the foreign service. Since there is a mandatory retirement at 65, could you possibly address how it would be, how I would be able to transition to competitive service? I want to put in 20 years for maximum pension. Okay, foreign service, I guess that's with the USAID, the USAID. So most positions in that agency, they're accepted positions. I don't think they have an interagency agreement either. You're going to have to do some research, but off the top of my head, I would say they don't have an interagency. Open to the public positions unless you have another special hiring path and you're going to show how you're eligible and qualified. It could be a little bit more difficult to get in, but you can get in. There, you know, There's thousands of open to the public competitive service jobs. I don't know what you mean by 20 years of maximum pension. You could do tw more than 20 years. You could do 30 years, 35 years, people doing 40 years. I had an email the other day to attend a ceremony for somebody who did over 40 years of government service. And I was like, my goodness, that is a lot of time. That is a lot of time to spend in any career, uh, especially a government career. Next question, KTEG 9153, who asks, I know some jobs require a U.S. higher assessment test. Does jobs from EPA require them? Also, does the test require an active camera? like university online exam. This is dependent on the job announcement. Many agencies use the higher assessment as one way to assess you. There's there's normally not a camera watching you, but it is there is a time limit. So you can't do it casually. You don't want to have Netflix on and you're laying in your bed and you're just casually doing it. You want to have a cup of coffee or whatever you use, maybe a cup of tea, and dedicate some time to answering it the best you can. These are multiple choice questions for the most part. The results are good for 12 months. You're not able to take the test again in that 12 month period. You will never find out what you ranked, but it could be used for multiple agencies if they require an assessment. So that's something to consider. The only thing I heard that involves a camera is there are certain interviews done by VUE, and those interviews are they give you the questions and you have to be on camera and record yourself and you're you're <laughs> you're answering the questions on camera and then that recording is sent to hr and i've seen that done probably five or six times in the last few months so it is something that agencies are using okay what do we got in the chat what do we got in the chat 
We got Money Cash. Do you know anything about new jobs processing migrant applications at Congress? Is how many when available? How hard to get? You're looking at jobs. You're talking about immigration. You're talking about migrant processing. You're looking at DHS. DHS has immigration. They have border protection. They have all those type of jobs. So are they hard to get? It depends. It depends on what you're trying to get after. In some of those jobs, there's an incentive. They'll pay you extra money to sign on. You can filter by the agency, look through there, see what matches your experience and keep applying for those if that interests you. But yeah, they are hiring more. There was a bill uh, passed or there's a bill in progress where they're going to be funneling even more money to hire for those type of roles. All right, next question. We got one from Janine Brown. I currently work for the Veteran Affairs. You mentioned internal hiring paths. How do I find these hiring paths when applying to jobs on usajobs.gov? How do you find the internal hiring paths? I'm, I'll show you really quick. Let's just pull up USA Jobs. Let's look on here. And where are we at? There we at. Okay. So on USA Jobs, let's say you are VA, right? Let's get rid of all the filters. This is how it looks. This is how it's going to look, right? As soon as you go to usajobs.gov, it looks like this. Click search. You're searching nothing. This screen shows up. You're going to click internal to agency. There's 5,000 jobs right now. Internal to agency. Once that filter is selected, continue to scroll down. Click department or agency. Find your department or agency. We're looking for VA, so we're going to go to the bottom right here. Once we click that, let's scroll back up. There are... 2,523 jobs that are hiring internal candidates in the VA. Now, give me a second. They're hiring internal to VA, but can, you have to remember VA is a humongous agency. So some of them are only going to hire for their sub-agency. Like, look at this. This is VHA. Let's see who they're hiring. Usually when you're looking down here, they would have clarification right here. So this says, this announcement is only open to current and permanent employees of the VA. That means anybody in the VA can apply. But check this out. First consideration will be given to employees of Birmingham VA Health System. So if you're in Birmingham, Birmingham I'm, I'm, I'm saying that wrong, Birmingham, then you have uh, you're, you're going to be first in line. It says it right there. And CTAP eligible applicants. So that that's who the priority goes to. But if you're a VA, I would still apply for that if you're interested in that. Other ones will say it differently. Let's see. This is all VHA. There's more than VHA in the VA. There's OIT. There's OIG. There's all kinds of different agencies. But for some reason, we're just looking at VHA. I'm going to give it one more shot. Let's look over here. Yeah, this is flooded with VHA. Most of this is medical positions. Okay. You also got VBA for benefits, right? So just look at the clarification uh, when it comes to when it comes to internal hire. But that's how everyone can look for internal hiring positions. Okay. All right. What else we got? Uh, next question is from Sean Gonzalez, who asks, I'm currently serving in the Army Reserves and have been in for six years. I haven't been deployed and I've never been a federal government employee. I'm also not considered a veteran. That's true for all everybody in reserves. If you do not have deployments, if you do not have active duty time, you are not considered a veteran, unfortunately. He continues, I'm looking to apply for the Army Re Reserve Administrator position, but I'm not sure if I qualify in the who may apply section. Do I qualify? And if so, what documents are needed to be uploaded? Well, Sean, I don't know if you qualify because I don't know what hiring pass you're eligible for, but let's look at it. Let's let's look at it for a second. Let me share my screen. All right. So this is it. This is the position that you're looking at. You're looking at Army Reserve Administrator, and you want to know if you qualify. Let's go to who the job is open for. You go right down here. Every single job announcement. You have the title. You have the agency. You have a quick summary. And then right below that, it says who can apply. This job is open to the following people. Are you CTAP? Or RPL, you're not because you've never been a government employee. So this doesn't apply to you. Are you a federal government in the competitive service? You're not because you're not a government employee. Land and base management, you're not because you're not a government employee. Peace Corps, I don't know, Sean, do you have Peace Corps or AmeriCorps? Maybe you do. You might qualify on that. 
Veterans? No. Even though you're in the reserves, you do not qualify as a veteran because you do not have the active duty time. And also training, training, time training, it does not count. Military spouse, are you married to somebody in the military? If you are, then you would qualify for this. Do you have a disability? Do you have a Schedule A letter? Because if you do, you would be qualified under this category. Family of overseas, if you're a family member of a government employee and you're overseas, maybe you qualify for this. So you're going to have to go through here. This, I believe today, this is the only job for Army Reserve Administrator. So you have to ask yourself those questions before you apply. If you apply and you do not meet any of these categories, what you will get is an email saying that you were found outside of the area of consideration. When people get the email of you were found outside of the area of consideration, most people think of a physical area. Like, wait a minute, I'm within commuting distance. What do you mean? Or this is a remote job. What are you talking about? No, they, they mean that you're not one of these. <laughs> You're not, you do not have one of these hiring paths. That's what it means when you're outside of the area of consideration. Uh, hopefully that helps. Hopefully that helps you. Let's get rid of that. Let's see. K. K. I'm a GS11 HR specialist in recruitment and placement. What other fields could I enter in your opinion? So, K, what you could do, let's just jump back to USA Jobs. All right. What could you do? You're in the 0200 series. I don't know how long you've been there. I don't know what you've done in there. But I tell you what, just knowing HR, I would say that you could go to 0300. 02 to 03 is a, is a jump made by many people all the time. You can go from 0201, you can go from 0203, and you can hop right into a 0301 because this is administration. HR work is administrative work. So you can make your experience fit a lot of these job announcements. And let's just look at it. Let's just compare it real quick. 0201 has over 200 jobs. That's great. 281 jobs. But 0301 has a, over 1,000. So you're looking at almost four to five times more opportunities in this job series. You also would qualify for 0303. This is without even looking at your resume. What I know about human resources, you probably could just go ahead and start applying for these 1,500 jobs starting today. And there's other ones that you could qualify for if you wanted to. Look at some of the other ones at 0300. And then HR, did you do anything with pay? If you helped out with pay at all in some capacity within your office, now we're talking about 0500. 0560 is not a huge is not a huge jump. Where is 0560? We still have filters on. Let's get all get rid of all these filters. Okay. Yeah. 0560 is not a huge jump. 0561 is not a huge jump. Um, did you were you involved in training? A, a big component in human resources is training. I don't know if that's what you did as human resources, but if you did, well, that opens up the 1700 job series. And now we're talking about maybe being an instructor. Maybe doing cur curriculum development. Maybe, you know, those were opportunities around you. Look at your location. Look at your exact experience and see what other opportunities are there. There are other opportunities. It's rare I find somebody who only does one thing and they can't transfer that into something else. There's over 300 government jobs. There are other, other opportunities. Nathan. Nathan, would it be easier? Uh, hey, before I answer this question. Go ahead and hit the like button if you haven't already. I really appreciate it if you could hit like. Thank you. Would it be easier to take a civilian position in the military? Okay, so we're talking about DOD, Department of Army, Department of Navy. Got it. And then transfer the veteran affairs. Would it be easier? I'm assuming that it would give me another leg up if I work in the military. Uh, not necessarily. <clears throat> What what results in your selection for interview is the hiring manager. So every hiring manager is going to have their own biases, their subconscious bias. If you have a hiring manager that worked at the DOD and had a great experience, and they say, wow, look, Nathan worked at the DOD too. Subconsciously, they're going to be like, oh, great. I love DOD people. Let's interview him. Now, take a step back and say, if the hiring manager worked at DOD but had a negative experience, Everybody was so arrogant over there. Everybody was so rigid. 
what was wrong with those people? And they look, oh, look, Nathan worked at the DOD. He has a completely different impression because he doesn't view the DOD as a favorable place to work that has good employees. So you will encounter that all the time. There are some people that look at, hey, this guy's already a government employee. He already knows everything. Great. Let's bring him in. Even if that's the case, agencies speak different languages. They have different acronyms. They have different systems. They have different policies. They have different SOPs. So it's not it's not as easy as say, oh, he's a shoe. He's a he's going to fit in like a like a glove, like a shoe. It's perfect. They're still going to know that you're an outsider, even if you are from different a different government agency, even if you are a current government employee. Excuse me. So, if you want to work for the VA, I would make that your primary goal and objective, and start applying. Where I wouldn't do this is if you're in a location and there's 10 times more DOD positions and the VA positions are very small. Well, then, Nathan, the goal is to get you into the government. So let's do that by looking at DOD. That's what I would say. Very situation dependent. All right. Good question. Good question, Nathan. Let's see if we got any other questions. Uh, all right. Okay. Let me use this opportunity if you need additional help, if you need additional help in getting a government job, then there is federal resume templates for the 0300 series, for the 0500 series, and for the 2210 series. If you would like an example on what a strongly worded, good format, good style federal resume looks like, you're welcome to go to the link in the description, download that, use that to help modify and improve your existing federal resume. That's available. If you would like to talk to me about your own personal situation so I can look at your resume, give you some insight and feedback from my perspective, you can schedule a call. There's a link in the description to schedule a call. If you want more personal assistance with redlining your resume, with editing, providing comments, suggestions in order to improve it to a competitive format, if that's what you need, there is a course option in the description below. You're welcome to sign up for that and I will work with you directly. And of course, for free, there's the newsletter. So weekly newsletter has virtual hiring events so that you can attend, meet human resource specialists, meet coordinators, especially if you have a non-competitive hiring path. It's going to help you out if you know the coordinator for that non-competitive hiring path. That's also in the description as well. Sign up for the free newsletter. And what else do we have? Do you have any other questions? Any other questions, go ahead and, and drop drop those questions in now. And if you have any video ideas, I want to know more about this topic. I feel like if I knew the answer to this specific question or how does this process even work or what is it like when you're in the government and whatever happens, right? If you have questions about that, if you have curiosities, leave those video ideas and I'll add it to my list. I have a list that I keep running. People ask me questions. Every time someone asks me a question, hey, what about competitive service? What about accepted service? Okay, got it. I, I write it down on the list. And those are future videos that I plan on making. So if you have a video idea, drop it in the chat. Or if you're watching this on the replay, drop it into the comment section. And I'll definitely take a look at that. Um, let's look. Let's look what we have here. Thank you for your advice. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody who took the time out to, to spend a little bit of your Sunday before the dreaded Monday shows up tomorrow. Uh, what do we got here? We got Matt. Matt O comes in with a question. I graduated from school and have worked for North Trump Grumman as an engineer for three years. Could I enter NSA as a GS 12? Potentially, Matt, you potentially could. Uh, in what capacity are you trying to get into engineering, which I believe is in the 0800 job series? If you're trying to get into the engineering series, you could. You did three years of experience. What did you accomplish in those three years? It's going to be incredibly important. The way that you describe your experience in Northrop Grumman, the way that you're able to, to explain it and show how you're eligible. It, I would, I'd say it's not far-fetched. Another thing is the location, as I always say. Are you near a major city? Because there is such a thing as GS-grade inflation. That does exist. So in D.C., New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, you will have, if you're an engineer, let's say in Oklahoma, 
you might come in as a GS11. That same engineer in DC could come in as a GS13, maybe even GS14 in some situations. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Good question, Matt. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks for joining me. Sam, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. MC, always lovely to have your support. MC, thank you so much. Uh, Parlor, nice to see you in here. Parlor, details. How details work. You're a government employee. They email people on the distro list. It's a distribution list. And they make you aware of different detail opportunities. And it's usually from another office. So say you're working in the correspondence office and all of a sudden there's a new opportunity to go over to the, to the uh, let's say the, the CIO office, right? The OCIO, the chief information officer. There's a six month detail position and they're looking for volunteers. You, you apply for them. And sometimes you have to send them your resume just to show that you're a suitable candidate for that detail. And then what agencies or what offices and supervisors use details as, oftentimes they'll use it as like a trial to see if you're a good fit for that position. It's kind of like a try it before you buy it because that position, they will post a job announcement for. And if you did that detail successfully and you were a good fit, you can apply for that job announcement and you better believe you're going to have preference. They're going to be looking to hire you, even though, you know, it might be open to the public. Hopefully it's an internal position, so you're not wasting everyone's time. But uh, usually it could be something like that, where they're seeing if you're a good fit or not. Even if you're not, if you're not a good fit or if they don't want you or they, if they do not plan on hiring permanent for that, it's a good opportunity to get experience. So if you have the bandwidth, if you have the mental capacity, I would encourage you to look for these detail positions because they will benefit you a lot in the long run. All right. Uh, next qu quick question. Evans Wonderland, how to get an OCONUS job as early career? I feel like living abroad and working would be a fun vacation. <laughs> in some cases, it, it could be. Most of your OCONUS jobs, most of your overseas jobs, they're going to come DOD. Look at the DOD, um, the Department of State. Department of State has them. They have some other ones as well. But you just filter. You just go to USA Jobs and type the type the country. So check this out. Do this real quick. Am I showing? I'm not showing, am I? Oh, I'm showing already. <laughs> All right, check this out. What country would you like to work in? You want to work in, because let's say in Spain right now. I spelt that wrong. My goodness. Okay. You go to Spain. There's over 30 jobs you can apply for. Let me get that misspelling out of the way. Over There's 33 jobs in Spain. You want to go to Italy? There's going to be more. Italy has over 100 jobs you can apply to. Now, you have to look at the hiring path. What about Germany? You want to go to Germany? Over 600 jobs. Let's, get, let's go to Germany. Let's pack the bags and head to Germany. There's over 600 jobs here. And look, there's a lot that are open to the public. So and there's an engineer, for the engineer that was in the chat earlier. Okay, what else? We got Japan. We got jobs in Japan. And then uh, we got over 500 jobs. You want to go to Asia? What about South Korea? We got South Korea. So you can do this search and you can just have your own filter. We got over 100 jobs in South Korea if you want to go there. So you can do this. Save the search. You can have one search filter say, this is my Asia. This is my Asia effort. I got Japan. I got South Korea. I got whatever else. And then save that as one search. And then you can do your Europe. You got Spain, maybe Portugal. You got your Germany. That's your Europe search. You know, you could do it like that. And now I'll tell you what one continent that definitely doesn't have very many jobs is South America. And also, I also believe in, in Africa, you're not going to find, you might find some DOD ones in Africa, but in South America, you really don't have much. So um, keep that in mind. Hey, it comes down to your resume. If it's open to the public, it's free game. Strengthen up that resume. Get after those opportunities. You can get overseas. I was just talking to somebody who accepted a job in Germany. The other, the other, uh, just less than a week ago. Okay. We got a video about special hiring paths. That's a good one. I did one probably over a year and a half ago, but it's like completely outdated. It looks horrible. <laughs> I should definitely update that. I think that's a good one. Thanks. Thanks for the idea. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week. I just want a remote work job. There's so many people that want that, but yeah, I hear you. You can get it. If you're persistent enough, you can get there. A thousand applications, no call. All right. Hey, thank you everybody so much once again. Spend a part of your Sunday with me. Um, and, you know, I look forward to doing another one of these next month. 
Let me know if you have any specific ideas, drop them in the comment. Make sure you hit like, share. Thank you so much. Have a great Sunday and I will see you next time. I will see you in the next.